Hello and welcome to the virtual edition of our year-round screening series, Film Independent Presents, and to this Q&A for the new A24 Hulu film, False Positive, by writer-director John Lee. I'm Jen Wilson, Senior Programmer with Film Independent. Thank you so much to our lead sponsor, the HFPA, and to our wonderful screening partner, Vision Media, who make it possible for us to do this virtual screenings for you. And now please welcome today's guest from False Positive, writer, director, producer, John Lee. Hi. Hi. How's it going? How are you? I'm well. I'm well. I'm excited to, to get the this movie out in the world and I go yeah. to Tribeca, I go to Tribeca tomorrow evening. I was going to say it's a big week. Uh yeah. so tomorrow's your premiere at Tribeca which uh theater or location are you at? I don't know. <laughs> they they the car will arrive and I'll get in it and then I'll just show up <laughs> at the place. Like that's the kind of information that just like let someone else be in charge of my life right. for a while. Cool. Yeah. Somewhere in New York, it'll, but it'll be fun. They're they're all outdoors, right? Obviously. Yeah, they're yeah yeah they're all outdoors, and it's supposed to be beautiful. And uh, the it there's a joy when you finish a project of like clearing your brain space. And tomorrow evening, I will feel much lighter than I have for yes. the last for the <laughs> last couple of years. How are you? A little crazy. I am seeing things, honey. Me too. I'm having the wildest mommy brain lately. I don't I don't think it's mommy brain. I think Dr. Kendall did something. I think they're in on it. In on what? Dr. Kendall gives me a bad feeling. I want to see someone more natural. There's a lot of voodoo out there. We just want to make sure that you get the best possible care. Confront whatever it is that's blocking you from you. I'm not crazy. They're trying to make me think I'm crazy. Doing great, Lucy. Just push. <laughs> This pregnancy shit is no joke, right? Yeah. Okay, it's really scary. Brilliant. So, uh, Film Independent has a lot of members that are filmmakers or aspiring filmmakers. Mm -hmm. So I usually start with a question of just asking filmmakers, like, how did you get into filmmaking? Um, I sort of fluked into filmmaking. My parents only took me to a couple movies my whole life. Um, I grew up like, you know, I, the TV generation of from Sesame Street to MTV to all those things. And watching movies, like watching Star Wars 90 times and watching the making of, I, it all was very logical to me watching movies, it all seemed very clear how they made movies. You know, it didn't seem like a, a mystery. Um, and uh, my film school, my, my high school, who I went to a really tiny, tiny school, um, had one media class ever and I just happened to take it and we learned uh, print and then radio and then film. And my first film was just literally shots of like an empty hallway then shots of an empty, a parking lot with nobody in it, then the shot of a kitchen, and then on the kitchen table, something moved, and then the title came up, The Invisible Man. And like, <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't fully understand the kind of weirdness of it, you know, like I was an odd kid like that, and my teacher was just like, your movie's kind of a mess, you know? But, <laughs> but they're like, but there's, there's something, you have some, you have some ideas, you know, you, you have, there's something there. And I, I, at right around that time, I was like, I think I want to make movies. And my parents were like, oh, you're good at math. You'll be a producer. Good job. And I was like, I think I actually like want to do more than that. And so while that happened, I also see the movie Stranger Than Paradise for the first time. And it just, it's like a huge punch in the face of like, wait, that's an option. You can do yeah. that. Like, you know, I grew up really, everything is like youth culture was mainstream. So everything, even if it's alternative, it's still on MTV, you know, like, and so like 
suddenly I realized there's this whole other world of dryness and comedy that I really, uh, I was just inherently a funny person and, and all those things. So this teacher, Stranger Than Paradise, and this teacher telling me to go to San Francisco State. And she's like, just go there. I think you'll like the film school there. And the film school really um, specializes in documentary and avant-garde cinema. And that was a true, wow. like, it was a true gift. Like I have since thanked that teacher, you know, because no one else was pushing me to go there. And it was the perfect school. You know, I learned, I learned about Samuel Beckett. I learned about Ross McElwee, you know, like I learned about like Prelude to Dog Star. Like I learned all these things where I'm like, what is, who knew that this was going on? Just like at just pure abstraction. And I just consumed it and loved it all. And so that's where I met Vernon Chapman at SF State, the guy who became my partner, who we made wonder shows in and Xavier Renegade Angel and the Heart She Holler with PFR. Um, so like it all started really there at film school. And I, I always tell people go to school because it's a great place to fail. You know, like I had so yeah. many movies that were just terrible in film school that I would be like, why did I waste my money and time? Like if I did it in real life, but then it's a great place to get criticism, to meet people, to really just immerse yourself into movies, which people have more access to the, uh, now than they did then. But I think the experimentation you have, it, it's a good discipline. I think it's a lot harder when you're on your own to like justify making a movie, uh, yeah. spending your money. It's hard, you know, it's just a difficult, it's a big commitment to do that sort of thing. And when you have an assignment or rules, I think that helps. I often, as a, as a person, I'm a, I'm a teacher like person and a lot of, you know, I, I, with kids, I will give them assignments like on set. I'm like, go write, go do that, work on that, you know, like, and like get back to me in a week, like a teacher. So I don't know. Yeah. That's that. Does that make sense? That answers my, my oral. Yeah. That's am that was amazing. <laughs> um, I need to have you talk to my nephew because my ne I've been trying to talk my nephew into going to, to college next year and all he's thinking about is the money aspect and i was oh, like oh yeah 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 i was like there's so many like yeah you're going to be in debt who cares everybody is well but you like sf state is not you don't have to be in that far like you don't have to go to a really fancy school like you don't you just need to go to a school that will give you access to equipment and will that will support and show you things that you might not have seen or known about that's right. really why you go to school is to expand yourself not as a step towards like right. a career. I didn't take my life seriously till I was 30. So like, you know, like there's still, you got to live your life as a, as an experiment sometimes as a, as an artist. It's project. funny that you mentioned Samuel Beckett because I went, uh, I went to four years of acting school at Illinois oh. state and that my, my first semester I had to do like, um, a, a theater management practicum where we were like ushers and ran the box office and stuff. Right. And the one of their first production that I worked on was the Samuel Beckett one acts. Right. And what, that blew my mind, you know, cause I'd never seen anything like that. So it is a totally, uh, I totally uh, am grooving with your suggestion to go to it, someplace that. It, it's basically what I tell people. Like I, I have daughters now and I'm like, I, I've, I once showed um, Xavier Renegade Angel. I don't know if you know that show, but it's a very strange adult swim CG animated show. And I sh it's 12 minutes long. I went back home. I, I'm from California. I flew from New York to California and I go, oh, there, my family's like, oh, what are you working on? And I, I put on one episode that's only 12 minutes long. And within six minutes, I was the only one left in the room. <laughs> my, my entire family had left. And I, I just... I. In my mind, I thought to my own children, I was like, if my kids someday show me something that blows my mind, I can't wait. Like, you know, like, so like the, the eagerness and the joy of having a paradigm shift, you know, like and seeing something strange and unique and understanding how that affects you and connects to you and understanding your place in that dialogue or history of art. I think like, that's why you go to school. That's why you have friends. That's why you challenge yourself. That's why you go see art. That's why you read books. You know, right. like that is the purpose. So anything that better does that, the money will come, you know, once you have a little bit of luck on your side. But I, I don't think you can go about it the other way around. I think the other way around is proven to be, you know, specious at best. Well, I think I think just that story you just told really speaks volumes about your about your career 
and uh, the, the shows that you've worked on, uh, Broad City, which is one of my favorites of all time, mm -hmm. and Wonder Shows In, which I just started experiencing, which is amazing. <laughs> it's an experience. Um, That's very true. Um, uh, I loved it just because it's everything that you just talked about. It's it just takes you to like another dimension. It feels like you're, it's like in another, in another world, a, a demented so, children's show made by someone, adults. But. Someone once told me that most of the work I, I, I've created that is my own, not like guest directing, but has been warning signs. Like I've been warning the world, like with Wonder Shows and it was about like, you know, how to just the truth the truth that we're spoon fed as children versus the reality of, of like the world. And then with Xavier, it's a warning about like, you know, uh, the kind of selfishness of sol of a solipsistic life of thinking that you are uh, an important individual. And then for the Heart She Holler, it was a warning of uh, the rise of white supremacy that we felt, you know, we, we'd, we'd made this show, we made that show maybe 10 years ago and Vernon, Allison, and I were like, it's coming. Do you not see it? And then, you know, after three seasons, then, of course, who gets elected president like five, four yeah. years later? You know, like, but if you were paying attention, you could you could sense it bubbling up. And that's, I think, new with, that's also similar with False Positive. I think it is a little bit of a warning. And I think just inherently I'm attracted to that kind of subject or that kind of uncomfortableness or that kind of mission, you know, with yeah. creativity. Um, I'm less of a person who reveals themselves per by my personal issues and more about how I feel about the world at large. So Ilana uh, Glazer, who's the star of this, she co-wrote this with you. Uh, mm -hmm. So what was the inspiration for writing this film? Um, that, that, you know, I, even though I just said I am not a very personal person that reveals themselves, it came from a very personal place. My wife and I uh, had a miscarriage. Um, and then my dad, who was a big, huge comedy influence on me, had passed away just a couple of years before that. And I was reading Peter Pan at the same time. And all these things were swirling around about like loss and memory. And I would have dreams of my father and wake up excited because I got to spend the day with him. And then there's this moment in Peter Pan where the parents are waiting inside the bedroom, staring out the open window. Uh, and I just realized that can't be good. <laughs> that can't be good nothing good is that and it just made me realize what a dark thing that is in the novel of Peter Pan but that is in no other version of Peter Pan but it's essential to the story of Peter Pan which is this parents kind of either two things happened right either the kids were abducted or they threw them out the window which is the evil that women can do which is they kill their babies and fantasize the I am evil not I, not, I had no idea about this. This is the book, Peter Pan? Yeah, in the book, Peter Pan. Oh, wow. You know, like, that's that's my interpretation of it. Not, like, they, it's just them staring out the window. And I was like, oh, only two things could have happened. Either someone took the kids and they're waiting for their return or mommy has had some sort of postpartum and threw them out the window. And it just made me realize with our miscarriage, like this sort of isolated feeling you have during fertility and trying to have kids or not succeeding or not. And it made me realize just our lack of support we have in the healthcare system here in our country, let alone for like people going through physical issues with fertility, let alone the mental issues involved. And I just like, I started to have a real empathy with these women who've done this and uh, understand understand why they felt like this was the only solution to protect their children. And that just seemed like a really, it seemed profoundly interesting in a way that I hadn't seen in cinema, you know, and not that the movie's directly about that, but I think that that theme is there, you know, yeah. and I think that the, I think to me, the ending encapsulates that feeling, you know, in a way that, you know, I, at least that's what I hope it does. This film ends up, having a little bit of a Rosemary's Baby feel. Were mm -hmm. you thinking of that film at all when you were making this? I mean, inherently, when you're making something about fertility, there you're gonna bring up Rosemary's Baby. Inherently, if you make a movie about, a, a sci-fi movie about going into the future, you're gonna talk about 2001. Inherently, if you're gonna make a movie about, about right. gangsters, you're gonna talk about Godfather or Goodfellas, right? Like. You know, I, I was certainly aware that I'm entering a history, 
you know, and I think that's when you are, when you do submit something into that history, you have to be aware of your history for the good and the bad. So for sure, how could it not be? But there's so many other movies that were on my mind at the same time. But I don't, I'm not going to deny that it's a clear parallel, but I don't think it, I don't think it matters ultimately. I just think that I'm certainly standing on the shoulders of Rosemary's Baby. The, the tone of this film is so interesting. And I'm wondering, um, everybody gives such a wonderful performance in it. And um, I'm wondering how you communicate that to the actors. Like, how do you communicate to Pierce Brosnan and Justin Theroux what the tone of the film is? Luckily for me, I'd known Thoreau for like 10 to 15 years. He's, he'd been in our, an animated show we did. He did a voice. He's been a big fan of Wonder Shows. And one of his favorite shows is Xavier. So he and I always sort of skirt around and we're very similar people that we're both like comedy people, but we also like there's this other side. And so he totally understood the tone from the script and then just from talking to me a couple of times. Alana, of course, wrote it, so she knew. Um, and then after that, you that's kind of the goal of the script, you know? The goal, the, I, the thing that I think people forget about in scripts is the poetry of a script, you know? And that you're supposed to evoke a feeling in a script, not just tell people visuals or not just give information. You know, uh, the scripts that I read that I like are in the tiny amount that you have a description, they're both evocative and informative, you know? And I read many a script that's just informative and it's just, you, you feel like it's work, you know, you feel like you're forgetting about the art. So I think that was a big part of writing the script was to capture that feeling. Um, and I think when they, when like someone like Pierce who didn't know my work and knew just a little bit about Broad City, I think he, it came from the page. It really all starts from the page in that, in that place. And then when they come to set, and they see their, their, their costume or their uniform, and then they see the place and they see the shots, you know, all those things just are the extra little, like, you know, the little crumbled nuts on top of the salad, yeah. you know, <laughs> like all that stuff just informs it, but it really comes, it comes down to script. And if there were questions about it, usually that means that the person probably didn't fully understand it and they might not be right for it but they all got it instinctually. Same with Gretchen and same with um, Zainab. They all read it and just fully understand it. And that probably just shows through in auditions or that shows through in when they are interested in it. They got the joke, they got the bit, they got the tension and the sorrow, all that stuff. So watching this, you know, I really felt like that the character Lucy that Alana plays, she doesn't, she doesn't really have a single sincere good guy in her life it seems <laughs> it seems like her husband is at first but then no he's not either and the, what really came out for me which I don't know if you guys thought about this when you were writing it was that um it's like guys pretending to be feminists now oh it's, for sure no I I literally yeah. like I have friends who during the Kavanaugh hearings were like, you know, I don't know, man, what do I do? How do I like have a meeting with a woman now? And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like you just have a meeting with them. And like, I, I think we just culturally, like I don't blame those men, you know, their, their goal is to improve and that they want to do the right things, whether they can or not, who knows, that's up to the individual and that's up to like whatever friends and partners they have. But I did show this to a couple friend, male friends and they didn't, they were like, you know, other people on the screening were like, oh, I loved all the microaggressions. And some male friends were like, I, I didn't even notice, you know, oh, no. and it's like, you know, and it, and like, I, I don't blame those men because like our culture has just made that. So why would they notice? Why would they, why care about that? You know, that this is why this, this last couple years has been a really, a really great awakening of a paradigm shift whether you're a woman or a person of color, it's finally feels like something significant has changed, you know, <laughs> like, and that's really, to me, I find that to be encouraging, what, even though it's been standing on the shoulders of tragedy, and even though it feels like it's a, it's a fight, I think there's something, I think there's something powerful and optimistic in a fight. You know, I feel like when you get to that point and you finally throw the punch and the person falls down, like, 
that is a victory, even though it might be like the, even though it might be wrong headed, the larger goal is important. And, yeah. and I wanted to, we, Alana and I really talked about like complacent versus complicit throughout this whole making of the movie and really wanted to make sure that the men in this movie, you know, because they have this privilege, they all, they, it, it, it kind of negates their responsibility. And I wanted to say like, you know, we all, it's all of our responsibilities and it might be on the person, the person who's blind, it might be their response. Mo- they might have the most responsibility to open their eyes. Yeah. I mean, what's crazy is that, you know, this plays really well as horror, but the parallels to real life are shocking. You know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's what I horror think, is, right? That's what right. Attire is based on an exaggeration of the truth, right? You take the rules that we've been handed and show, okay, well then here's the ending. By by the game you've designed and the rules that you've designed, here's the ending. Do we really want that ending? And and that's always been the goal of satire. So I I often think of this, I was like, this is not a horror, it's not a satire. I was like, oh, it's psychological satire. That's the genre I sort of came up with, you know, that, yeah. and there are many other movies that have done that. It's like a very micro subgenre of the world, but yeah, it. I wanted to use the horrors and I wanted to use the comedy because I, I always decide like when I'm on a roller coaster, the question I, I always ask other people is like, when you're on a roller coaster, do you scream or do you laugh? And I laugh. And it's like the, it, it's the same, everyone has that same feeling when you're going over the edge, but it's how do you respond? And so like, it's either a nightmare or a joke. And, and ultimately both of those two things meet, their intersection is tragedy. <laughs> and that's like, sometimes the only way to deal with a tragedy is as a nightmare or as a joke when therefore we get satire, you know? Um. I had seen um, last year, actually, you know, when we get to the end and we find out what the deal is with with Dr. Hindle, uh, because I thought, well, it's either going to be a devil baby or it's actually Dr. Hindle producing like an army of his own children. And then uh, I had actually seen a documentary last year called Baby God. Yeah. About a guy who actually did this. He actually, for decades, inseminated women with his own sperm. Yeah, yeah, there's a... I was like... Most, it's horrifying absolutely it, horrifying and it's not always illegal like that's the trail tragedy there is a bill in congress that has just been floating there for way too long but like some doctors just move to other states and rechange their names and do it again some doctors lose their license some get sued and some are too old but yeah i did a lot of research research on all those doctors and a lot of detail about hindle is in the script a lot of like little patterns that they would do the kind of they say that you have an issue with your hormones when it's actually, that's not true. Like a lot of women don't have issues with their hormones or the numbers that they're hitting are pretty natural to fluctuate. You're going through a massive change. Why wouldn't your body go through a change? So these doctors sort of use that kind of worry or introduce worry, you know, which came, which came first, the product of a need. I think the doctors introduce this sort of anxiety and then kind of take advantage of it. Uh, but yeah, it, it is, um, yeah, it's it's surprising that it still happens, and there was. I think small- I think they're absolutely psychopaths. I, every time I've heard that story, I just come away with I don't understand the kind of person that can do this. They have the, to be a psychopath. The the conclusion I came up with is that they're extremely lazy people. You know, <laughs> they actually <laughs> don't care about humans. They'd rather do the easiest thing possible, which is before the meeting, go into the bathroom take care of business and then go inseminate the women with that business. And, you know, like, and that's just like a true laziness. And that laziness comes from a real hubris of feeling like they're going to help and save these and, and provide a solution to these women. And instead of like, actually like being honest, doing the hard work of being honest and doing the hard work of like care, you know, it's just, it's dumb and simple. And yeah. Yeah. Which often is the, the, uh, the other side of the coin to psychopath, which is lazy and dumb. Did you have any idea when you were making this that uh, Alana actually would be pregnant for real during your promotion time? No, I've known her for a while and she's talked about having a baby. Like my wife and I have babies. Uh, I mean, we don't have babies. We have children now, 12 and 14. And Alana's like really in, admires them and is really f- nice and supportive of them and really interested in them. She's such a kid at heart, you know, and I think we share that her and I, and she loves kids and stuff. So it's, 
I'm not surprised, but that was never, one person did ask me, they're like, is that a publicity stunt? And I'm like, I don't know if there's anyone in the world who's gotten pregnant as a publicity stunt. And if they are, they're probably like a, you know, it's a certain kind of narcissism that Ilana Glazer is not. She is just happy to be at this place where she gets to be a mom with her partner, David. And like, they're, you know, like it, it's, I think this was a, an odd setup for them to then get pregnant because this movie is not the doesn't put it in the most beautiful light where you know what her life so far has been you know it has been in a in a more beautiful loving kind of supported light um so the end of the film you know you sort you sort of go into some body horror um which i loved that that you went there but the 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 final moment with her actually you know trying to breastfeed wendy that I just got a major flashback of uh, David. What was David Lynch's first film with that weird creature that he, he has to head. take care? Of. Yeah. yeah. And I, I had a, a couple of moments where I, I felt were very David Lynch. Was he for an sure. inspiration for you? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's actually a moment in there very that's basically a version of a David Lynch moment. Um, it's when it's from Lost Highway, the first half of Lost Highway, which is one of my favorite se- favorite things of David Lynch, where the you know they keep getting these videotapes from this creep that clearly is videotapes inside their house, and it's yes. like strange. This person, and then they see this weird light go off, and they go. The husband goes down the hall into darkness, into pure darkness, and um, I do the same thing, uh, and the movie kind of becomes a metaphysical thing and David Lynch's thing. But I always thought I, and I'll tell the story this way. I always thought that this, the scene that's in my movie was in the David Lynch movie. I always thought it was, I, I told people it was my, one of my favorite David Lynch jokes is the guy goes into the darkness when you're just like, Oh my God, nothing good. And comes out and he's just like, it's nothing. It's nothing. And I always just thought like, Oh my God, I love that bit. And then I was watching lost highway to, to like, just watch it as research and to get the feel of it and look how they treated the cinema and the cinematography. And then that bit didn't happen. And then I called Vernon and I was like, wait, is, did I make this up? And he's like, no, that's always been your joke. He's like, that was always your version of David Lynch's, you know, thing. And it was always a funny joke because but I thought so too. I thought that was straight out of David Lynch. That's crazy. So, so uh, the setup is out of David Lynch, but the punchline is not. Wow. And I, and I was just like, oh, then I'm putting it in the movie because it's to me, it, that's the tension of this movie is this like what's going on, this unknown thing. And then this man, clearly you hear the safe sounds in the distance and he comes back and he's like, it's nothing, you know, when clearly it's something. And I, I thought that kind of punchline to me, it, it so it's it's the closest thing that's a direct lift or a direct reference to another movie. You know, there's a few other kind of inspirations from movies, but that's the one that I think is the, the that it, is. It's funny that it was actually inspired by a false memory, but I actually got it anyway. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> I, it was a false mem- memory that was my own my own uh, punchline, which arguably could be an improvement on David Lynch. <laughs> um, so you open tomorrow at Tribeca and then uh, do you release Hulu in theaters the t- and then Hulu? Uh, no theaters, Hulu theaters. on okay. the 25th. It's Hulu a bummer. I, I wanted it to be in theaters, but like theaters, I I don't know what the good side of history is right now to be on, but uh, you know, it's a, it's sad theaters right now just because despite that there's a vaccine, despite that people in the red states don't believe it, they, they're not going to theaters. And we, you know, even though we have vaccines, a lot of the, the population is not going to theaters just out yeah. of like, discomfort i think it's going to be a while which is sad so i try to support them as much as possible it seems like things are either having a hybrid like a hybrid theatrical slash streaming or or just the streaming yep Um, yeah exactly and that that might be the case for a while yeah i I have hope i have hope that we're going to have a major comeback for theaters so i i think there's no doubt there's been a history of like you know people thought books would die and here we are books are still great people thought like you know uh painting would be dead but we still go to the museums like people still make paintings i think movie theater the experience and the way to view a movie that will it's it seems impossible to go away 
you know, like people are still going to go see movies. There's still something really great about everyone laughing at once at Jackass or everyone watching a horror movie and getting quiet and as the pr protagonist goes towards that door and you're like, what's in that door? You know, and there's that buzz, like you can't replace that feeling at home. You know, you can't replace a live concert experience at home. It just doesn't, it just doesn't exist. So it'll come back. It's just a bummer that it's gonna take a while and that we've lost so many great institutions and theaters and, and places like that. And so many movies that you probably would have seen have just floated off into some other harder to find place. Well, thank you so much for coming to for coming to talk about false positive. What's next for you? Like, are you going to continue working in features? Do you think? I'm or, trying. It's a yeah. hustle. It's a yeah. hustle. You know, like my advice is to everybody: like, you got to have like five things going always at once. And if you're lucky, you're screwed because three things happen at once. And if not, you just have nothing. So like, you gotta you gotta do that. But uh, yeah, I've got a couple scripts that I just finished during the pandemic that I'm out with. I was attached to a movie that was during the pan, you know, that was supposed to shoot during the pandemic and who knows what's gonna happen with that because of schedule and stuff like that. And, and you know, yeah, so I don't know, I, I, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. Like I write, <laughs> I write don't enough. worry about you. Yeah, yeah, don't worry about me. Okay. I'm doing all right, yeah. Okay. <laughs> thank well, you very much. Congratulations on this, I loved it. And oh, uh, good luck with the rollout of the film. Thank you, see ya, bye. bye.